Oops. Uh, I'm Bill Bereza, one of the attorneys here. Um, before I started working here at Carrier Law, before I became an attorney, I was a uh, software developer, computer scientist, um, uh, started a software company, um, had about, uh, about 15 years of experience in software, um, spent a couple of years out of college, out of grad school, working for the uh, National Security Agency as a computer scientist, uh, doing large data uh, mining software. Um, so a little bit of interest in that personally, um, in terms of in terms of crypto, I uh, did have, you know, do a little bit of uh, dabbling in crypto when it started, uh, partly to try to start receiving payments as an attorney. Um, weren't a lot of people obviously uh, 10 years ago or so uh, willing to pay or able to pay in, in Bitcoin. So um, not a lot there, but um, this is kind of interesting to me. I'm not, I'm not going to claim to be an expert in all things crypto. I'm not gonna even try to explain a lot of details. So if you're someone who knows who's deep into this, this is really just gonna be a, trying to make this as simple as possible, easy analogies. Also, I wanna make it clear, um, this is not an advice, investment advice about what to do. Um, I think uh, to this morning's news is kind of a good example of, of uh, you know, why I wouldn't give advice about whether to go into this or not, because I got a little, just drew a picture here, it's easier to show it here. Uh, kind of example here in the bottom of my uh, sheet here, is kind of a graph, you know, a hand-drawn graph of what the price for gold versus Bitcoin looks like this past week. Um, so right here is last night, the price of gold starts going up. And then last night, the price of Bitcoin started going down. Um, I don't know what the trend is. I'm not saying, I'm not predicting anything. I'm just saying that uh, one of the things about crypto has been the idea that this is digital gold, a substitute for gold, a digital substitute for gold. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case this morning, but I'm not making any predictions, but I want to, so I want to make sure people are aware of that. This isn't going to be, um, some promise, but for people who want to dabble in it or people who are really interested in it, or if you're lucky and you did get started early on and you've held on to your Bitcoins and cryptocurrency, you might have a large value of assets stored there. Um, so I kind of want to explain, you know, from a legal viewpoint, what that means for you, what that means for your estate, um, how to protect that, you know, what happens to your cryptocurrency if something happens to you. Um, and so talk about a few things here, a couple of things I want to make sure you'll understand by the end of the presentation, uh, you know, what actually is crypto, uh, it means a lot of things, you know, what is a blockchain, that's a big part of how it works. What is a wallet? And kind of a fun one is what is an NFT or non-fungible token? Um, if you've seen pictures of, you know, uh, GIFs of gorillas around or things like that, you wonder what that is. That's what the non-fungible tokens, some, some of them are. Um, kind of as, to start off, you know, kind of talk a little bit about, you know, regular money we're all used to. So here's my here's the wallet, my wallet, and I've got a dollar bill here in the wallet. The dollar bill has a serial number on it, but you go pay for something with this. No one's tracking the serial number. No one's gonna record that I paid this dollar to buy that candy bar. No one's gonna know this is my wallet if, you know, just because my ID is in it. Um, you don't know that this is my wallet. You don't know that this is my dollar. I really don't have any way of proving it to you besides the fact that you saw me pull it out of my pocket. Um, that is sort of the one key thing about cryptocurrency that is different. Cryptocurrency, every single coin, every single piece of currency has an ID. It's tied to a wallet. It's tied to a specific uh, person. Um, it, and the transaction, every piece of the transaction is kind of followed. Um, so one key thing to remember about crypto is the blockchain. So you have a crypto coin. So you'll say a crypto is a coin a coin that you receive, you've paid somebody some money from that coin, that person got that coin from somebody else who got that coin from somebody else back to the person who mined it. And I'm not gonna really explain how mining works, that's really too, but basically just to understand that at some point in time, every specific coin was created by somebody 
and it's been assigned to somebody, it's been passed along. The blockchain is basically just that list of who got what coin. Every single coin has a list. It's all a public record, it's meant to be. That's the whole idea of this is that it's a public list that everybody gets to look at, everybody can verify who owns it. So when I say I have a certain Bitcoin, that's because I have a wallet. So the way you hold Bitcoins, and conveniently, this is the term they use, is it's a, it's a wallet. It's, that's, you know, think of it that way, it's a wallet. Every wallet has a unique ID or unique identifier. It can be a phrase that people memorize, but really it all comes down to numbers. So your wallet has an ID. This Bitcoin here says it's in this wallet. It came from this wallet. You sell someone a Bitcoin for money, it's now being go now going to their wallet. That really, in a nutshell, is kind of the simplest way to think about it, is there, every, there's a wallet, your wallet has all the money. Um, the question is, uh, how, is your, how do you hold your wallet? You know, a wallet like this, I drop it, I lose it, somebody might pick it up, and it's there now, it's their cash. And Bitcoin is kind of similar that way too. If you have a physical wallet, if you have your key, and I'll get to the point what a key is, but the idea is it's, it's just sort of as transferable as cash in that way, except that it's cash that anybody can track. Um, kind of an interesting couple of things in the news that came up recently that I'd also um, worth talking about. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a 20 some year old couple, there's a couple in New York City um, arrested by the FBI for stealing approximately $37 billion worth of cryptocurrency. Um, this was cryptocurrency that was stolen several years ago. It wasn't worth $37 billion then, but now it's worth $37 billion, or at least it was at the time of the arrest. Uh, I read, and so the U.S. government has seized the currency. The government now controls it. There's actually, you can go look up a court case. It's the U.S. versus X number of Bitcoin tokens at address, wallet addresses, whatever. Um, so those, those things are real things that the government seizes. The warrant for the arrest of the couple um, very interestingly lists all the information that the government used to track these coins. Um, the nice thing about someone stealing Bitcoin is if, if the government can find out the person who turned it into cash, they're gonna be able to trace it back to who stole it possibly. So this couple had you know, $37 billion worth of crypto coins. They traveled around the world. They opened accounts in different countries. They logged in from different places. They opened accounts everywhere. They started their own marketing business, started accepting payment in cryptocurrency for you know, supposed uh, marketing ideas for customer, you know, anonymous customers. Um, it's all spelled out in the warrant. So that's, you know, money laundering is not, you know, people talk about it and people are probably doing that, but um, the nice thing, it's actually kind of a great benefit for the US government or any of the government trying to track what people do um, is the crypt is it's all there. Um, and the, you know, the, the Canadian trucker story is another one. People donated Bitcoins to Canadian truckers. Um, and if there's a way to connect your wallet to you, and your Bitcoins came out of your wallet to, the, to some other group and the government decides they're gonna seize all those or freeze them all, or they're gonna go back and look at the people who donated the money. It's all there, it's a, it's a public record. Um, some people might, you might be saying, well, I've heard that, you know, it's all anonymous. It's all, uh, no one knows who they are. These are all anonymous people out there. So technically true, you can create a wallet. Anybody can create a wallet. So what a wallet is, so I'll put this aside here. So as far as for us, when it comes to trust and estate planning, the wallet is actually the key thing. So I kind of think of a wallet. I really kind of think of a wallet. It's easier to think of a wallet as a box, as a treasure chest. And there's a lock. And there's also a, 
a drop slot. So a wallet is, and this has a, a unique number. So anybody can create a wallet. Um, a wallet, all it is is you, you create a, um, a, two things to create a wallet. You create a, kind of two keys. One is your private key. It's just a bunch of numbers. There's a lot of math involved. Basically what it means is that you have a key to this wallet that only you are supposed to hold on to. You have another one that is public, that's shared, everybody, that's the, the public address for your wallet. That's the one that everybody can see, can use. Um, so the idea with a, with a wallet is you can create one, you can create it on your computer and not have it tied to your name at all. You can have, you can give out this public key, people can start putting money, putting coins into your wallet. Anybody can, anybody in the world can put coins into your wallet, as long as they know your wallet's ID. The private key is what you do if you want to pass on those coins to someone else. Um, and I'm not really, you know, we could talk about, you know, giving coins to other people. If you pass on coins to somebody else who wants Bitcoins, you don't need to share your ID. You don't need to, nobody needs to know who you are. But in reality, in, in a world where you want to buy groceries or gas with cash, you're going to need to convert these coins to dollars. At that point, most banks are going to want to see your name. They go on to see your ID. They want to know in the US, they're going to want to know if you're a US citizen. They're going to want to know your name, social security number. So you want to get a coin out to turn into dollars. Your name is going to be tied to that wallet. Someone's going to know which wallet goes with that name. That's, that's really where the, the whole thing works with the FBI finding those people who stole $37 billion of Bitcoins. Because at some point, they created a company that accepted stolen coins that you know, they turned to cash. That's basically, and then the government can just track it back from there. Because at every point when a Bitcoin gets converted to cash, there's a bank involved. Banks are required to report large transactions to the IRS. Um, there's just you know, for just basic tax reporting purposes, the, the bank is going to be reporting those kind of conversions or the company that's converting your Bitcoins to cash. So this is kind of the general idea of what a wallet is. Move this over. So kind of in practice, how are you creating a wallet. Uh, if you're like 90% of people who decide to dabble in Bitcoin, you're not actually creating a wallet. You're not going to download the software on your computer and run it. Um, you're going to go to someplace like coinbase.com, which is one of the oldest companies. You're going to open an account. It's going to look like a bank account or it's going to look like a stock brokerage account. You're going to have the option of depositing cash, linking it to your bank account buying certain types of cryptocurrency, putting it into your account. So, so one type, we've got the, you know, Coinbase as the example. You've got an account at Coinbase. That's just like a bank account, as far as um, your estate planning, as far as a trust goes depending on the company, depending on, just like depending on the bank or the credit union, they may let you, let you name a beneficiary of that account. They may let you name a joint owner. They might let you put that in, have that retitled to a trust. So kind of from my, our viewpoint, you know, if, if it's like this, you kind of treat it like a bank account. Um, and the issue there is a lot of these companies, these, these uh, crypto companies are relatively new. They don't really have a lot of uh, we deal with a lot of companies that don't even do trust accounts. Um, and the way this works is you don't have an actual key. You're, you're not holding the key. Coinbase has their own wallet key that actually holds the Bitcoins. Those aren't actually being tied to your name. So, so it's just like with a bank account. You put dollars in the bank. Your dollar bills are not sitting in the bank. Those dollar bills exist on paper with the bank. If you want them out, 
the bank's giving you something from somewhere. It's just like with Coinbase, you don't have, there's not actual coins tied to you, there's coins tied to Coinbase and they'll give you cash or coins if you request them. So that's a, you know, what we call a custodial account or custodial wallet. Um, that's one option. The other option is um, what's often called a hot wallet. A hot wallet is, is a wallet that's yours, but you keep it hosted. You, ha you have it on some website or on some company somewhere because you're moving money, you're moving coins in and out all the time. You wanna make it easy for them to do. You might be setting up some type of automatic transactions. So the key, what that means is Coinbase, you don't have a key, they have their own key. A hot wallet, you basically, you have a key that you've given to somebody else, uh, some company that you hope you can trust. Um, you may or may not actually really have control over it or may not even know what that key is, but they've created a one for you. That's one option. And, and the third most common type of wallet is what's called the cold wallet. Um, I mean, a lot of people say, well, I've, my, my crypto is in cold storage. It's basically what it means is it's sitting on a USB key somewhere or it's sitting on, actually you can print it out on a piece of paper because all a wallet is, is a bunch of numbers. The key, that's really one thing to remember, this is all numbers. So your money is tied to a series of numbers. The numbers could be kept on a floppy drive. <laughs> the numbers can be kept on a sheet of paper. Uh, the num numbers could be etched in glass. That's, you know, you could have one copy only of that with a cold wallet. Um, so it, kind of listing, you know, a custodial account, a hot wallet, cold wallet, that's kind of also um, is the order of how, um, you know, people say it's more secure as you have a cold wallet, but also means there's a little more danger if something happens to you or the wallet. You know, you die and you have your money at Coinbase, Coinbase is gonna have some rules that, to get it to your heirs. Um, so to kind of talk about what happens if you die and you have nothing in place, you don't have a will, or you, you don't have anything. Coinbase, you might be able to set up a beneficiary for the, for the value for the coins. A hot wallet, the company hosting that might have some option to be able to transfer coins out of there because they have the key. A cold wallet is one where you might have a key and you've probably heard stories about the early investor in Bitcoin, early investors in Bitcoins who had a, you know, a USB key with millions of dollars of Bitcoins that they accidentally uh, ran through the laundry, th threw in the trash. Uh, I think there's a story about a guy who was actually, you know, hunting through a landfill in New Jersey looking for his lost crypto key. Um, that's really what can happen because the key, without the key, there's a lot of complicated math involved. And in theory, what the goal is, is that nobody else can figure out what your key is. Nobody else can um, use that, you know, figure, you know, use that key or make a new key to get to your coins. Because without that series of numbers, nobody's transferring those Bitcoins out of that wallet. So back to the wallet idea. So that's really, you know, I really think the best way to picture it is it's just a box, it's a box of coins. Um, and you have a key to the coins and you can make copies of the key and you can give copies to someone. So let's say you have a box of coins and you want to give a copy to your friend that you, you know, you want to be able to make sure that if you die, something happens to you, you lose your key, somebody else can get into it. You know, if people have a, have their neighbors share house keys, that sort of situation. Um, you know, you give it to someone, um, what is that person going to be able to do? They're gonna be able to go into those coins and take the money. Um, the interesting about cryptocurrency is anybody anywhere can, you don't have to go down to a bank account. You don't have to go to Comerica and try to pretend that you're signing as somebody else. There's no forgery involved. It's all just math. If you have the right numbers, anybody can transfer the money. So when you give someone a key to your wallet of money, of crypto, you're giving them a lot of power and trust. Um, and you're, you're 
really essentially doing the same thing as if you had a pile of coins there and you said, hey, I'm gonna use these coins. I'm gonna let you get to these coins if I need them. Um, and you're going to have to hope that your friend that you trust actually doesn't go and say, well, no, hey, you know, those coins, some of those coins are my coins, or I've been mixing my coins in here, or, you know, nobody knows who's been adding coins to this wallet. So how do you prove whose coins that those were in the first place? Uh, it's, a, it's really, in that situation, it's kind of identical to when we, what we have with um, shared property with your kids. You know, we always talk about here, don't put your kids' names on the bank account. Because once you put their names on the bank account, it becomes their money just as much as yours. You know, someone sues the person who has the key to your coins and they give up the key to somebody, that, that counts as their money as much as yours, potentially. Um, so that's, that is, you know, like all property, that's the danger of not having in anything in place. Um, the worst case scenario is you die, your kids know you've got, you've been telling them for years, you've got, $12 billion in crypto coins. And who's going to find that USB key? Or you've got it, you know, kept safe somewhere and you know, printed out on paper in a safe deposit box. And you better hope that somebody recognizes that for what it is. Um, if you've had a, a parent or relative who's passed away and you've had to go in and clean up the house and find all the things, I'll find all the documents. You know, the idea that a USB key that's, you know, no bigger than this pen cap or, you know, or no bigger than a fingernail, really, that you're going to find that and, you know, realize what it is. Um, that's a kind of a dangerous uh, and scary thing if it's actually something you care about. I mean, 90 percent, a lot of people are going to just do, you know, the basic accounts. Um, so let's go to this here. So you have your cold wallet. You want to make sure that if you're not able to get to the money, somebody else can. You have two options. Like I said, you can give somebody a copy of that key and hope they don't abuse it and hope that somebody doesn't take it from them. Um, or you can set up some rules about that. Um, if you want to make sure that somebody can, you know, somebody, if, there's, if you want to say that someone you trust can use your stuff for your benefit without actually owning it, it turns out that we already have something a term for that. We already have something that exists in, in the real life, in real world that predates crypto that covers that situation where you want to have someone you can trust who can manage your stuff for you. Um, it's called a trust. That is really, a, you know, the only realistic plan if you want to have someone that you can trust to manage your stuff for you, because what a trust does, and we've, there are, years and decades of plans is that the trust is someone who doesn't own your stuff. They manage your stuff. They can manage it for the benefit of someone else. There's all kinds of rules and laws in place about what happens if they abuse it. There's rules that protect that person that you trust from taking the blame or if something happens with the wallet. Um, I wanna go back to that couple with the $37 billion in stolen crypto. Because, because of the fact that you can track every transaction, what happens if you've been paid by somebody with some crypto coins that turns out came from somebody who had stolen it from a bank? Um, you know, you, at that point, you might be thinking, well, this, that's stolen property that you might have to return. Um, you know, the person that you've named as a trustee is not gonna be responsible for that if they didn't do anything wrong accepting it. Um, you don't want to be responsible for that either. That's one of the benefits of a trust is that the ownership isn't tied to the person who's managing it for you. The other situation is um, what's going to happen when something happens to you and you want to make sure the kids can use that. So what happens to you with crypto right now if you ended up needing long-term care? We talk about Medicaid here. 
Medicaid would see crypto as being an asset just like anything else. You know, even though you might not actually have cash and you, it might be difficult to turn it into cash, if you have a, a, a million dollars worth of crypto coins, uh, Medicaid's rule is, well, you can have $2,000 worth of stuff and you can spend it down until you get $2,000. That includes crypto as much as anything else. I'm not going to go you know, spend a ton of time talking about the whole Medicaid rules. We have other workshops for that. But basically, um, one of the things you can do with the trust is you can put things in that trust that are protected from Medicaid, from lawsuits as well. Because like I said, you know, this dollar bill, if someone steals it from me or someone sues me and I have a dollar bill, I'm going to have to hand them the dollar bill if I owe them the dollar bill. If Medicaid says this is $1 too many for me to keep when I'm in a nursing home, I'm going to have to pay the dollar bill. We can do Medicaid protection trusts that say if you've had it set up correctly, whatever's in there is protected from Medicaid. And that can include your crypto. So the good news is, is you can put your cryptocurrency, your Bitcoins into a trust. So that's the good news. Um, now the question is, should you put that into the trust you already have, or should you, you know, or should you just put that into the, you know, a new trust that, you know, that you're creating for your house, your personal bank account, your retirement savings. Um, so I, the kind of one thing I want to talk about next is taxes. So this, um, is another interesting new thing that's happening with the world of crypto. Um, there's been news lately, obviously, um, the IRS has been, has not really come out and said exactly what they're going to do with a lot of uh, transactions. But you know, going back to the way Bitcoin is, you've got, you, you five years ago, you spent $500, you bought some Bitcoins, Today, that might be worth 50,000, well, probably more like $150,000 maybe. $150,000 equals 100. So let's see, yeah, just sort of talk about it. So five years ago, you bought $5,000. Today, it is worth $150,000. And you need to cash that out. Or you decide you're gonna you're gonna buy the you know cottage, you know, put use that to pay for a cottage. So that's $145,000 of taxable gain. The IRS is pretty clear that this is gonna be treated, you know, Bitcoin set buying and selling it is just like an investment, um, tax the same way an investment is going to be. The interesting thing is, um, if you, and this is something people we're not really sure about, but the IRS is making it clear that they probably will do this, is let's say you took your Bitcoins from your wallet. So you had Bitcoins here. You decide to convert it to a different type of coin called Ethereum. You, so you take X number of Bitcoins, you, you trade that for what, you know, more Ethereum coins. So these are two different types of coins, just like a dollar versus a euro. Um, the question is, is there tax owed at that point? Maybe. So you might end up creating extra tax based on conversions that you don't actually have dollars to pay for because the IRS doesn't take crypto to pay income tax yet. The IRS is gonna want US dollars and you're gonna have to then convert whatever this is into US dollars. So you might have tax based on money you don't have and then when you need to convert that to cash, now you might have more tax. Um, so these are things to um, be aware of. And then because we're the rules, we don't know the rules yet what the IRS is going to do. There might be disagreements. Um, you know, the IRS, one way to think about, uh, you know, for tax lawyers and accountants uh, filing tax returns is a tax return is your first offer to the IRS. You know, it's your, you know, for your proposal of what you think you owe for taxes. And then the IRS might come back and say, well, no, this is what you actually owe. The, the way that Bitcoin goes up and down, the way that cryptocurrencies go up and down, the rules that IRS hasn't figured out yet, 
Um, there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to taxes with crypto. So that's one thing to remember. We don't know yet what the rules are gonna be for, for the IRS, for the income tax. Um, and this kind of brings me to NFTs. So, so here's an example. So this video is obviously being streamed over Zoom. You could take a snapshot of this video image right now. You could go find a company and um, turn this picture into what's called an NFT or a non-fungible token. So what is an NFT? Um, basically all it is, is you take some thing, some digital thing, you pay someone some money, someone who can create Bitcoins for you or can, you know, will accept cryptocurrency. They will basically just stamp it. They'll stamp this with their key. So they've stamped it saying, yes, I've stamped this coin or this, this NFT, this NFT belongs to this wallet. That's really as simple as it is, is it's just a file that someone says, my private key has said that this thing belongs to this person's pu public key. So this proves you own that digital file. Um, NFT stands for non-fungible token. What that means is, all it means is there's, it's a unique digital file because there's a unique stamp on it saying, you know, this person said, you know, says that this person owned it. Um, which can be a great thing for you know, people who are actual art, digital artists and who are creating digital artwork and they wanna be able to prove that, or they wanna be able to sell it and be able to prove a chain of ownership. Um, because obviously the thing with a picture on your phone or computer, you can make copies and send it to seven people. It doesn't mean they own the picture. I mean, you know, for journalists use digital cameras these days, they still own the rights to their pictures. Um, so really all this NFTs are is really just a way of using crypto to say, here's the proof that this person owns that coin or owns that image or owns a, it can be anything. It could be a music file. It could be a video. It could be this entire Zoom presentation could be turned into an NFT. Um, so why are these in the news? Because there are people out there who have created programs that basically take generic images, make variations of it, sell each one of those, you know, there's an auction for those. Um, and you might ask who's spending millions of dollars worth of Bitcoins to buy these pictures. Um, I'm not gonna go into all, of, all the details of how money laundering works, but that's kind of one theory. But basically let's say you've created it and you got lucky and you sold it for a million, you know, million dollars worth of Bitcoins. Turns out that at that point, the IRS is gonna say, well, you just made money. You just created some artwork, you've got income now. You, you did some work, you've been given something of value. That's, kind of, that's what income is to the IRS. Now you have a million dollars in crypto that you might have to, you know, that you do have to pay income tax on. The other interesting thing is the, uh, there's a different um, income tax rate. So you sell collectibles, artwork, uh, that's taxed at a different rate than investments in stock. Your Bitcoin coins that you might be buying and selling are taxed one way. Your funny picture of a gorilla is going to be taxed a different way. Maybe. These are all, you know, we're assuming what the IRS is going to do. Um, but do you want to be in a situation necessarily where you're opening yourself up to a mistake with the IRS? Um, and that's kind of where I want to get back to the idea of a trust. So we got taxes. We have wallets that if you lose them, you can't ever get them back. Um, we have people out there who want to take your wallet from you, just like with all your stuff. There are car accidents that happen. There's Medicaid. There's the state of Michigan that wants you to go broke before you go in, when you go into a nursing home. There's a lot of people who are going to want your stuff. Um, the hard part about losing something like cryptocurrencies, it's very easy to lose. It can be considered to be worth a lot of money. And if you lose the crypto and you still owe taxes on it, you might end up, you know, because imagine if you 
owe tax on some coins that are sitting in a wallet in a key that you don't have anymore because it went through the laundry. Um, the IRS isn't going to care about those types of things. Or, they, or you filed a tax return and did something incorrectly, and now you're going to have an issue there. Um, so for these and other reasons, um, kind of the recommendation, if you're really serious about getting into this, now, if you've got you know a few hundred dollars sitting in a Coinbase account somewhere, um, you know, and you put that into your current trust, or you have a beneficiary on it, you're not really. Um, I'm not going to try to scare you to saying you're at risk there. If you've been mining Bitcoin since 2010, or you've, um, you know, you got lucky and you held on to a few coins for the last 15 years, or or well, not 15 years, but if you held on to a few coins for the last, you know, 12 years or so, or five years. Um, do you want to mix those concerns, you know, the tax issues up with your stuff? Do you want to, do you want to make sure that if you die, kids don't know, have a hard time finding your coins? Um, the idea with, you know, when calling a crypto trust is you have all your wallets in here. So um, the nice simple thing is because a wallet has an ID, um, just like the fact that the U.S. government can seize wallets full of crypto coins and have a U.S. versus wallet ID number X73, you can say, you can have a document that says, my wallet number X73 belongs to this trust. And I can prove it because I have the actual private key. Um, so the difference between, a, you know, what I'm calling a crypto trust and your regular old trust you might already have is... The recommend, you know, the recommendation might be in your case, have this trust have its own tax returns, have it have its own tax ID. You know, if there's a mistake made in the tax filings, do you want that showing up on your personal tax return? Or would you rather have some separate thing that has to maybe file a separate tax return? Um, you know, do you want to have to worry about what happens if the IRS changes the rules on how they're dealing with things? Um, also, if you, you know, if the gains really are as big as they could be, and you have fifteen billion dollars worth of gains in thirty years because you really believed in it and the, everything turned out your way, you might not. You know, there there are different inheritance rules, estate tax rules. The, um, that having a trust that has different a different entity ID or a different tax ID from you can help save estate taxes for the kids later on. We don't normally deal with estate taxes here. Most clients, you know, most people we're dealing with don't have the $11 million, but you know, if you put $500 or $1,000 into Bitcoin in 2010, you might have, you know, you could be lucky enough to have that large amount of money. Um, you know, I've, we've met clients who Bought, really, you know, bought in early on and just sort of sat on it. And, uh, you know, I have a, a couple in their 30s who retired because they have $26 million worth of crypto that they, you know, were able to grow into investment. Um, you know, that potentially puts them over the limit for estate taxes. And if, there, if there's going to be any issues with the IRS, um, having a separate tax ID. So a tax ID is one possible you know, reason you might want to have a separate trust. The other one is the um, the idea of the the lost coin, the lost wallet, the the cold wallet. The safest way to hold your crypto is in a physical, separate wallet, a piece of paper, something that's not tied to the internet, something that hackers aren't going to be able to get to. Um, but that's there's danger in having that, and if something happens to you and you need to be able to to sell that, um, the other thing about the, the crypto market is it goes up and down quickly. There's a lot of fluctuation, um, a lot of fast move, moving parts. Um, you might need to be able to sell this quickly. And if you're, you know, sitting in a nursing home or you've again, been hit in a car accident and you're in a coma and money and you're not able to deal with the market, you might want to make sure that someone can, you know, sell off your Bitcoin if Russia has decided to invade and the value of Bitcoin's sinking through the whole, you know, through, through the floor. Um, so those are things where um, 
a recommendation would be is to have a second copy of your key with someone you trust that they can actually get to. So that would be a what's called a co-trustee with a trust. With your normal trust that you have, your house, most trusts that we do, you're the trustee. It's your stuff. You're in charge. You don't need your kids or somebody else making decisions with your stuff or touching your stuff while you're alive or competent. Bitcoin cryptocurrency is a little different because the moves quickly you want and you've got a separate key that you need to secure and you want to make sure that someone has it and you don't want to just give it to your friend and hope they don't mess with it. So by making them a co-trustee, the other thing is they're, they're bound to the rules. They have to follow the rules that they can't mess with your coins, but they have access to it. Um, just naming someone as a backup doesn't really help if they can't find the key or they, it takes time to do the paperwork to make them an active trustee, or uh, you know the doctors aren't willing to say that you're incapacitated. So this, unlike you know your usual trust, you might have your house and the rest of your stuff in. You might want to have a separate trustee with that you trust, who you really know understands this stuff, who can have access to it right away, because then they're also tied to the rules for that. And then. The other thing, because there are so many easy ways to mess this up, what do you do with Bitcoin when it goes to the kids? You've got a wallet. You can't give each of the kids a copy of that wallet because they'll all have access to all the money. Money, you know, you need to move things around. Are you going to be sure that any of the kids know what to do with, with Bitcoins? Are you, are, you know, you're going to want to have, are you going to want to give them Bitcoins? Or you want to give them money? Or let's say these coins are generating income for you. There are ways to use cryptocurrency to actually generate income um, by loaning them out. Um, that might be something that makes more sense, or it might be that it's too expensive to sell. Um, if you've got the money tied up in some kind of obscure crypto that is expensive to get rid of, um, do you want the kids to end up being liable for those costs? So that's the other, the kind of the third point of a trust is that it can it can set rules in place for the kids. Um, so really, you know, even if you're the person who has all your crypto in a cold wallet somewhere that no one else knows about, in reality, you probably want to have, you probably have a backup plan. You probably have backup copies somewhere. Or if you're married, you might've given your spouse a copy of it and hope that nothing happens to either of you. Um, you know, the, the big secure, the takeaway that my, from today that I have for people is, um, this stuff is messy, unpredictable. Um, I'm not, this could be a huge thing in the future. And if it's big for you, you don't want to just sort of leave it to chance. You don't want to just have that USB key sitting in a drawer somewhere with a post-it note on it and hoping the kids find it and know what to do with it. Um, you also don't want to just give someone a copy of things and hope that they don't mess up what they're doing. Um, and because this is different from your personal things, you know, you might have your personal trusts over here. The idea is to keep these things separate. Um, I had a little kind of list of some things I want to make sure that we sort of go over today as well, too. Um, so Medi I do want to talk a little bit more about Medicaid planning. Um, going back to... No. Yes. My earlier slide here of... So just a reminder, this is a blockchain. A wall has an ID, an NFT can be a smiley face. Um, the great thing about a blockchain that's nicer than gold coins is, and I've dealt with, you know, we've dealt with this with clients, is they have a, they, are, they collect gold coins and bullion. Um, they need to keep records of when they bought these things if they're worried about Medicaid because Medicaid has a five-year look-back rule if you wanted to protect things. Um, so you can prove very easily that you've owned some cryptocurrency for five years. That's a great benefit. Every single coin has a unique stamp that includes the timestamp of when you got it. Um, it's a great feature for cryptocurrency. You know, if unlike dollar bills and cash, you know, you, the whole story about stuffing dollar, you know, cash under your mattress um, you know, that's still your stuff. You're not getting you. And actually, unlike, um, cash, you can't just simply say I'm, or you can't really put realistically, you know, expect 
the state of Michigan to believe that this pile of cash in my pocket, I gave away to my trust five years ago. There's no proof of that at all. I mean, you could, maybe if you had a document that you printed five years ago with the serial numbers in every bill, you could try that. But um, just the way crypto works, the nature of it is there is a timestamp for everything. There is a way to protect it for Medicaid. Um, because uh, you want to make sure, you know, these are things that you're, you can't really expect that your kids are the person. Because in reality, you know, usually people have their kids as backups on things. If you're not, if something happens to you, but you necessarily assume that your kids are going to understand how any of this stuff works if you've even figured it out. If you've managed to figure this out, that's impressive. If the kids can figure it out too, well, you're really lucky. Um, it's probably better if you're really going to be doing any kind of serious investment in this. Having in a trust with a trustee who knows what they're doing that you can trust, and that trustee then is going to be tied and required to follow your rules and your instructions, which is what the trust does, that's going to be safer than just sort of holding the wallet and saying, I'm you know, hoping that nothing happens. Um, big thing about uh, bad planning is planning with just hope. You can't just hope you know, that nothing bad happens. You can't just hope that um, you know, Russia doesn't invade tomorrow. You've got to actually do something about it. Um, and that's the same thing with, with if you're do, getting into crypto, um, if you actually put some you know, real amount of money into it, you can't just hope that you, you'll figure it out later about what happens if something happens to you. Um, and, and the great thing is, is you know, the, if we're talking the value it can grow to, you know, any type of planning you do is gonna be worth it compared to the, you know, the potential gains out there on these things if they actually did take off in the future. Um, but I do want to kind of end, leave you to at the end is, again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting or advising people to invest. We're not investment advisors. Um, I haven't looked at what the market's doing since nine o'clock this morning, but, um, you know, it could be that Bitcoin goes the way gold is. We don't know, but um, that's, that's kind of the interesting world of this. We don't, you know, it might be that, who knows, maybe in the future that if, if we don't know after after things like sanctions happen and we end up having you know a change in the economy after the stock market crashes we might find out maybe bitcoin it was the way to hold the money um and if you're gonna do if you're gonna hold money you might as well hold in a way that you can count on that's kind of really what why in the end the big recommendation is is what we call a crypto trust you know something that you can actually count on being there and not just hoping will be there Okay, so I can take questions now. Um, okay, I think um, I'll make sure I've got anything covered here. Um, Bill, do you want me to share the um, slide that you had? Yeah, you can share the. So yeah, those two pictures I had of the actual graph. So I, you know, my drawings were just the drawings. So the actual, you know, the actual charts of the you know, price of gold and the price of uh, Bitcoin today. I think Chris has those up. Okay. So but, I, have uh, I, a question. Thing... I, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. One of the questions is, what is the value of an NFT. What's the okay, value so, of it? Yeah, How do so you determine the, that? Oh, okay. So the value, um, well, it's really like artwork. You know, what's the value of a painting? It's what someone's willing to pay for it. Um, and you can create an NFT today, you know, and you and it costs you a certain amount of money to create the NFT. Someone has to stamp it. You pay someone to you know what they call mint the nft it meant your token for you. you sent you send someone your picture or your digital file they stamp it now you have you've paid a certain amount so it's at least worth that much you've paid for it um and then there are, are auction markets out there so just like with some you know the used junk in your basement or the artwork you might have if you list it on ebay just like with ebay you can list your nft for sale someone can pay and whatever they pay, that's kind of the value of it. And so what they pay you is in cryptocurrency, that cryptocurrency is gonna have some dollar value, some cash value at that point in time. So whatever is in that point in time, you know, if they, 
you know, kind of one thing to think about here. Uh, here. So you sell your smiley face gorilla and the value of Bitcoin is up here that day. And then tomorrow the value of Bitcoin is down there. You're going to pay, you're going to owe tax based on what that value was that day. And then let's say this is December 31st. And now you've got to find the cash to pay for that income tax that you had. So the value is whatever it was on the date you sold it. Wow. So, um, that's, that's another one of the fun things that people are going to find out, you know, people from 2021 who went wild and crazy with NFTs are going to find out this year when, and, and the thing is, we don't know for sure what the IRS, the, you know, it's, we're, we're basing these on rumors and theories of what the IRS is going to do. Um, but, you know, they're going to see there's money there. And if, if the government, which who needs money, sees that there's money to be had, they're going to find way. They're probably going to say, well, yes, we're going to hold you to it. Um, I have another question. Yes. If I have a protection trust with your firm, could I just add this? Can I just add crypto to that protection trust or do I have to create a new trust? So we... You can't, we have been add, adding um, crypto accounts to people's current protection trusts. Um, you know, if, it's, if these are small amounts or, you know, if, you, if it's just something you're doing for fun, it's not a big concern, um, you know, it, that's probably okay. But it's, it's kind of like the way, the way we see, for example, um, if you're a landlord and you have rental property, you know, and you're renting it out to tenants, you could keep all your rental property in the same trust with your house and maybe nothing will happen. Maybe, you know, but the concern is if you're really worried about your rental LLC that you've created suddenly now owes money to some tenant who sues you, do you want to, do you want to risk the possibility that they might be able to go after other things in the trust? Um, and, and my, especially with taxes, my thought is that because there's, tax rules involved do you want to have your personal tax involved with what the irs might decide to change their mind on um, the other issue with crypto is if you are really serious about it um, i would really recommend you want to have some plan in place for what happens with your keys if you're not able to manage it you know your your own personal protection trust typically the way we do it though your personal trust that we do here you're the trustee your spouse is nobody else can manage your stuff unless something happens to both of you. Um, but, you know, if something happens to both of you and in the meantime, you know, the Bitcoin's changing in value quickly, you might want to have someone who can act quickly. So the idea with the crypto trust is you have someone who understands the stuff, who's named as a trustee, who can go in quickly and do things for you. Um, it's a way to have a trusted third party who holds on to your key as a backup. That's not just a, you know, hope your kids figure it out if something happens to you. So that's, that's kind of the idea with the crypto trust is um, walling off, separating tax liability, separating management and control because, you know, man, just like with a business property, why we do, why we do separate business trusts for most clients, managing a business is a lot different from dealing with your house, you know, have man, dealing with tenants and rental property after you're gone or something happens to you is, is a lot different. The liabilities are a lot different. So just like with business property, um, and this is something where you'd meet with an attorney. We talk about what's the value of your crypto investment? Is it worth doing? And here's, you know, we'd lay out, here's what the cost would be. Here's what the benefit would be. You know, if it's worth it to you or the risk is high enough, you can do that. But at the same time, you can just put those, especially if you've got like a Coinbase account where you can name a beneficiary and that's and you're just doing it for fun with a few hundred dollars or something, I wouldn't worry, but um, we can put it into a trust and we've done that here, but um, if you're serious about it, a separate trust makes sense. 